Why, why are human beings so addicted to ritual? Why are we so hungry for ritual? Why is that? See, God has got a movement and change and growth and development. And we're addicted to ritual because we like security. Perhaps is it? So does it feel good? I don't know. Does it feel good to... We had, we had, you'll be bored. We had some Buddhists living downstairs from us a long time ago in a flat. Do you remember? Mm -hmm. Remember when we got here? And uh, every Wednesday or Thursday night, whatever, it was a nightmare. You had to turn the stereo right up. Because they'd all be downstairs going, oh, I don't know what noise they were making. I won't even try. And it, was, it got louder and louder and louder and louder. And it was the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. It'd get right inside your head. Right on your wake after a bit. But they loved this repetitious ritual, whatever was going on downstairs. You had to turn the music up pretty, pretty loud. You know, sometimes the old leather skin was melting away. Because they were melting away down there. And it was, why do people love that ritual? There's a, there's a fresh interest in it. Have you noticed the Green Belt Festival has been on the radio? Have you noticed that? Well, when I was young, when I was alive, <laughs> Uh, it was, it was, you know, the cutting edge of stuff. Young and Christian, this music festival of Christians in Barker or somewhere. I don't know, where is it? Cheltenham Racecourse. And now, now it's all um, ritual. Where did that come from? I was listening to it this morning a little bit until I turned it off, and it was like very liturgical, very liturgical. Why are human beings so wedded? To ritual, why is it so appealing? Jesus has got relationship, and we seem to love ritual. You know what you're getting with ritual. Say, say something. You know what you're getting with ritual. Do you know what you're getting with ritual? Because it's a ritual. It's repetitive. You never know what you're getting here, do you? Mm. No. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps a, a few more rituals. Maybe if you could come and address next week, that would be superb. <laughs> Somebody bring something smelly, and we walked it about a bit. And you just keep saying the same thing. That'll be fine. <laughs> I don't get it. But these people have been completely taken over by this need for a ritual. Here it happens to be circumcision. There are others, so many others, that we can fall prey to. What have we got? In him you were also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with the circumcision done by the hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God, who raised him from the dead. Now the verb peritendo used here is often used in the Old Testament. It's a ritual technical term for physical circumcision, which was the outward sign of God's covenant with his Old Testament people in the bodies of their males. It had been of huge significance to Paul before his conversion. He had been a Pharisee. It was the source of enormous spiritual pride for him and so many others around him. The outward sign of what set him, what set his people apart from and above other men. That's kind of important, that above bit. We need to remember that Paul had been no stranger to supremacist religion or its rituals. And we need to remember that he was well placed to recognise that sort of phenomenon when he saw it. He says, I see it in philosophy. Even within the Old Testament, though, this term came to be used in an ethical rather than a literal sense. Uh, something that should accompany being the set-apart people of God, as it were. Jeremiah 4, 4, circumcise yourselves to the Lord, circumcise your hearts, you people of Judah, or my wrath will flare up and burn like fire. Deuteronomy 10, 15, the Lord set his affection on your ancestors and loved them, and he chose you, their descendants, above all the nations as it is today. Circumcise your hearts, therefore, and do not be stiff-necked any longer. What Paul's referring to, next from the Old Testament, in the same breath as talking about that great and important gatekeeper ritual, which was the entrance ritual, as it were, into the people of God in, in their way of thinking. What he talks about next is absolutely breathtaking, the language he uses for a man who used to be a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He picks up another Old Testament phrase to describe circumcision, the sign of the sacred covenant, as that done in the flesh by the hands of men. And we'll see in a minute why that's such a big thing. We'll come back to that shortly. 
So the heretics appear, therefore, to have been trying to give the Colossians extra pseudo-philosophy from the Greek mystery religions and from prognosticism, fullness, and also mashing that into a syncretistic package including elements of Jewish ritual and religion that was not actually extra because it had been superseded by the cross of Christ. Paul's about to explain that. <clears throat> Three things here. You've already been circumcised. And your circumcision is not a faulty, idolatrous circumcision. We'll come to that. And here's how Christ did it for you. Repentant baptism and resurrection of faith. Circumcision in, in Genesis um, was the entry word for every good young Jewish lad into the people of God. As we've said, it was the gatekeeper ordinance. We're not talking about medical circumcision, anything else of that sort. This is exclusively all about a religious right signifying that you're one of the special people. And these heretics coming across to Colossae were saying there's still hell for the Colossians. There was extra they weren't getting and that they, the Gentiles of Colossae, remember, need to be circumcised forthwith. Paul's response, direct, plain, clear, obvious. And what I'm about to show you I haven't read in the commentaries. Let me show you what this verse here is saying. You've already been circumcised. In who? In who? Christ. Christ. In Christ, you were also circumcised with a circumcision not done by hands in the removal of the body of flesh in the circumcision of Christ, is what it says there. Words meaning circumcision in red, words defining or, 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 or describing that circumcision in green into linear translation in gold. Does that help? No, because the sun's come out you can't see. <laughs> Do you love being in this building? Really, isn't it? Shall we try curtains? Let's try these initially. Shall we? Mm, a bit better. Slightly. Not much. Yeah. In whom, also, you were circumcised, having been circumcised by another. So that, that's it, it's an indication it's passive. Done by somebody else. In whom you were also circumcised, with a circumcision, not, that's the word for hands, Kairos, okay? Not done, poieto, not done by hands. Very important phrase. How, how was that done? It was done in the circumcision, not done by hands, uh, in the removal of uh, the body of sinful flesh. Sarkos is sinful flesh. There's a tie up there. Uh, in, in the circumcision of Christ, or by the circumcision of Christ of the dead. Paul is telling these Colossian Christians they have already passed that gatekeeper ordinance and their privilege is such they weren't just circumcised by a big famous rabbi, they were circumcised in Christ or by Christ. Now that in Christ formula keeps cropping up and it refers to the believer's union with Jesus. And the benefits the gospel confers on us, it confers by virtue of our union with Jesus. And because they're benefits that Christ has earned and Christ has won, we get them by un being united with him, with the one who's earned them or won them. The circumcision won by Jesus. What's that about? Now, Christ was circumcised the eighth day. And by virtue of your union with Jesus, if you're united with him, that's done. But there's more to it. Because Paul takes that imagery, what happens in the, in the circumcision of the baby, and he sort of unpacks it a bit, and he says, yeah, but hang on, the flesh that was removed from you was the, the, the sinful flesh of your human nature that was fallen. And that's been taken away and dealt with in Christ. In your repentance, as expressed in baptism, and faith in the resurrected Jesus. So what you've done is you've laid aside the body of flesh, this sinful life and this sinful body, lived to suit your sinful human nature. And therefore you're circumcised with Christ. Does that make sense? This is not a physical man-made circumcision done with human hands. That's an interesting phrase in itself. That adjective there, done with human hands, where's it gone? Yeah, right, that one. That one refers to Old Testament language denoting idols and idolatry. Because 
in the Old Testament, in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, that which was made by human hands translates as an idol. You see? That's, that's stunning. Pretty loaded language for what Paul's talking about here. Paul sets the Jewish circumcision the heretics of Colossae were promoting over against the circumcision of heart that God had done for these Colossians, and he calls the former idolatrous. Idolatrous religious ritual. It's that done with human hands. It's that which is idolatrous. Done in the flesh. And their circumcision was not a laying aside of physical flesh, but of the life lived for the sinful flesh. He was in Christ. And here's how Christ did it for you. Repentant baptism and faith. Resurrection and faith. 